Good morning, my name is Richard Lowe. Thank you for joining us today on um, a topic which I think would be very uh, insightful for people who are thinking about investing overseas in the UK and possibly comparing with investing in a property here in Singapore. As I say, my name is Richard Lowe. I work with One Global Property Services, which is headquartered here in Singapore with offices in many countries around the world. Now, before we get into the presentation, what do I mean by an investment property? Well, basically it's a property that's not your primary residence where you live in, but it's a property that's been bought as a form of increasing your net worth that over time will increase in value and over time will bring you a rental income as well. So that's my definition of a, an investment property. Now let's get into the presentation and look at some facts and figures that have major impact on driving uh, value and property growth in both markets. First of all, uh, this is a table from the Henley Group, which is one of the biggest relocation and, and visa companies in the world. And it ranks London number one for best residence by investment cities for business index. And on the right hand side, you can actually see various criteria that it uses to measure uh, the cities. And it's also good to see that Singapore is up in fourth place. Uh, so again, both major cities uh, that we're comparing and contrasting uh, towards the top of the chart here. Now, London has topped the rankings for QS uh, uh, based on the student uh, city, and uh, Singapore has come in 17. So why does this uh, have some relevance and importance to real estate investment? Well, students can make up a, a fairly large percentage of potential tenants. In fact, London has an estimated half a million students alone. There are also uh talented people well-educated people that very often will stay in that city after graduating and add to the economy and continue being tenants especially in countries where it's very difficult and expensive to get on the housing ladder like the uk this graph shows the exchange rate between the sing dollar and the pound sterling over the last 10 plus years in fact, when I came to Singapore back in 1995, the exchange rate was roughly 2.6 Singapore dollars for the pound. I actually remember selling a property in the UK in 2007 where it was actually 3.15 Singapore dollars for the pound. And today we see it hovering around about the 1.8 Singapore dollars per pound, which is a huge change over time. And effectively makes the Sing dollar uh, very strong and strong buying power against the pound sterling, which means it is an excellent time to look at investing in asset classes in the pound sterling. We can see there was a drop uh, from about 2016, which is when the Brexit referendum occurred, and it dropped by about 20% and has stayed pretty much there or thereabouts um, for the last few years. Many people do think that the pound sterling is undervalued. It's the fastest rebounding economy um, as we hopefully start to get out of uh, COVID-19. And so there is a potential that not only could you make a, a, an FX gain, but also a gain on a real estate investment as well. Now, owning property has uh, different forms of leaseholds and freeholds in Singapore. There are options to own property in 99 year leases, which is the most common these days, occasionally 999 years, and very occasionally uh, freehold. The UK uh, for substrata apartment buildings is all leasehold. A minimum is 125 years, 250 years is probably the average, and it tops at uh, 999 years. And for landed properties, it's freehold. Now, Singapore doesn't allow uh, a top of, of leases. So once your 99 year lease has expired, your property has a zero value. 
whereas the UK does allow a top-up of the leasehold. So even if uh, after uh, the shorter tenure of 125 years, we're getting close to running out, it is po possible to top up. Another interesting point is ownership via a company structure or owning in your own personal name. And these days there is a company that allows a person to buy and invest the property via a company structure, which is very quick. It can be done literally in less than a day. It's very cost efficient. It's about one tenth of what it used to cost and has numerous benefits in terms of saving on income, uh, capital gains tax, and a whole variety of other advantages, which I'd be more than happy to share with if you would like to get in touch and know more details uh, about owning a property through a company structure in the UK. Now, there are significant differences in mortgage options between the two countries. The UK provides an opportunity for interest only, whereas Singapore is principal and interest. The big difference here is that with a principal and interest, the monthly amount that you're servicing your mortgage will be much higher. But then again, gradually over time, you are paying down your principal and ultimately will have full ownership uh, of the property at some stage in the future. With an interest only mortgage, you're only servicing the interest. So as an example, if your mortgage is £100,000 and the annual interest rate is 3%, that means you'll be servicing over a year £3,000 of interest, which equates to £250 per month. Now, with just £250 per month, uh, you're almost certainly going to be having a rental income that will make your monthly income cash flow positive. Whereas in Singapore, it's fairly unlikely, depending on the loan to value that you take, that you're going to get uh, a very good positive cash flow, and it could well be uh, a negative cash flow. Now, if you think about when you're investing in a property, if there is no intention to live in it because it's purely a vehicle to grow your net worth, then having an interest only mortgage is um, very helpful. In fact, I would say that at least 90% of my clients, if there is an opportunity to take an interest only mortgage, they will do so. Primarily because they then have positive cash flow, they're in uh, charge of that cash, they're never intending to live in it. so. They don't need to pay off the mortgage and be free of a, a mortgage when they come to retirement. It may well be that in 10 years time, they decide to sell the property. And over that 10 years, there's been a good capital gain and they can take the profits and move on. Now in S Singapore, the loan to value on a second property for a Singapore citizen is 45%, which is effectively means you're paying a 55% deposit down. In the UK, um, we could easily get between 60 to 70% loan to value. At a push, it might even get up to 75% loan to value. The interest rate though for an overseas investor is factored in, so it tends to be a little bit higher at three to 4% for a variable rate, um, and probably between three and a half to four and a half percent for a fixed rate. Now there is no TDSR, total debt service ratio, if you take a loan with a UK bank, whereas if you take it with a Singapore bank, then there is a TDSR impact, which is important to keep in mind. In the UK, mortgages are offered closer to completion, whereas in Singapore, typically you're gonna get a mortgage offer before completion, um, and that can be often before even signing the sales and purchase agreement. Now, the next few slides are taken from a very interesting DBS uh, residential report that was released in October this year. And some of the highlights are the fact that historically Singaporeans have a great affinity to real estate. We can see from this slide that a significant amount of people's uh, investment portfolio is in real estate. Um, the concern is, is with the drop in population, um, will real estate still be something that appreciates as much as it has done in the past and are there concerns that maybe people should rebalance their investment portfolio as we can see on the pie chart on the left at the moment approximately 41.7 percent of people's 
investment portfolios in real estate, which is a big uh, chunk of their portfolio. In fact, if we look at the bar chart on the right, we can see that in 2001, it was even higher at 51.9%. So looking at the fertility rates, we can see on the top left that back in the 1960s, it was almost a, a fertility rate of six people per family. It's estimated that the replacement rate just to keep the population uh, at equilibrium needs to be 2.1%. But at the moment, it's as low as 1.1, uh, sorry, 1.1, which basically means the population is dwindling in Singapore, um, like many other countries around the world, which is having a major impact as we look to the future about how many people are working and paying taxes to support a larger growing aging population. We can also see on the bottom left, the decrease in average household. So back in 2000, it was averaging at 3.7 it's now averaging at 3.22, which means that it may well be that people don't need the same size apartment. Instead of having three bedrooms, it may only be two bedrooms as an adult. So the size of the apartment may well become very important as we move forward. Here we can see on the left, the projected Singapore population. The red line actually shows indigenous Singaporeans and notes that at around about 2030, unless something changes, the actual indigenous population will start declining. If we factor in the expatriates and PRs, again, unless the government changes its policies, then by 2045, the total population will start declining. Compared with England, we can see that the population of England is approximately 56 million at the moment. That's expected over the next 20 plus years to rise to 62 million, which is an increase of 6 million, which ultimately is an awful lot of houses. Here we can see a ratio when we look at the bottom uh, line here of the ratio of the number of working people supporting those over 65 who are either in retirement or close to retirement. We can see here that the number has more than doubled since 2005 of those who are over 65, whereas the number of people has only, uh, who are in their working years has only marginally increased. So the ratio has almost half from 8.1 to 4.3 in a matter of just 15 years. This is a property house price index. Uh, the yellow line depicts HDB, the Housing Development Board or the public housing. The gray is the private uh, condominium property. And the red line is the private landed property. You can see that generally speaking, the shape of each of the lines is somewhat similar. We noticed that after the global financial crisis, there was a big increase in property prices up until about 2013, then a gradual decline as cooling measures were brought in. And recently, particularly in the last year or so, we've seen a significant increase in property prices. This is not just in Singapore, but many places around the world have started to see an increase in property prices, just because people are rethinking about what kind of property they need to live in. And does it need to be a bit larger? to have a home office, especially if people are going to be working a lot more from their homes rather than the office. The red line here shows the London House Price Index going back to 1999. And we can see it's a very stable, gradual increase, reflecting the fact that London is a safe haven market where you can invest and have many years of data. In fact, we go back to the 1960s when records began, you could almost extrapolate this line in a similar way. Comparing that with other asset classes like gold and crude oil, then we can see those asset classes are far more volatile. You may wish to ask yourself the question, based in what season of life you're in, 
or your personality. If you are somebody who's more conservative, wants to be able to invest in something with the peace of mind that over medium to long term, the value of that asset will go up, then certainly London presents a very good argument for that. This shows the average house price increase over the years, going back to about 2005. Again, generally speaking, it's a good steady line. The biggest blip since records began in the 1960s was during this period here, 2008 to 2009, which was the global financial crisis, which is where we saw property prices drop by an average of 18% in the UK, which is the biggest drop since records began. And certainly not as dramatic as certain other countries like here in Singapore and when I used to live in Hong Kong, um, an even bigger drop in property prices. But it's quickly recovered to the point whereby in the last year we see this line really getting steeper and we've noticed that in the last year there's been an increase of 13.2 percent on average in properties across the UK which is a very very strong uh, growth rate for the UK. Here we see the last year's increase in property prices based on uh, the different regions. And up at the top, the Northwest, which uh, has cities like Liverpool, Manchester, Preston, Burnley, has actually seen an average increase of about 18%. The West Midlands, um, which is where Birmingham is, seen again, very strong growth of 15%. And interestingly enough, uh, London has had the least growth, albeit about 6 7%, which in any normal year would be a very, very good year. But it really has been an incredible year defying um, all expectations as we entered into the pandemic at the beginning of last year. Um, but it really has been driven by a variety of factors, which I'll go into in just a moment. So what is driving property prices across the UK? Well, there's been various things. People are reconsidering where they live and that's very often been upgrading to a larger apartment, definitely with uh, a large balcony or access to open parkland because people want to have immediate access to open space and recreation. The UK had a temporary stamp duty holiday that could save over uh, up to 15,000 pounds on properties up to half a million, which was a major catalyst. We're experiencing the lowest interest rates in over 300 years, making mortgage financing the, the, the best in, in living memory. There's been pent up demand primarily because the supply of property coming on the market has dwindled, partly because of local town planning authorities having staff on furlough, so uh, planning applications have slowed down. When it comes to building the property, uh, building contractors may have had to uh, work at reduced capacity, so it's taking longer to build a property. And at the same time, many people are looking to, to buy and upgrade into new properties. So uh, it's almost like a perfect storm coming together. And what we have seen in recent months as the UK allows travel is that many of the high net worth investors, particularly looking at prime central London, have started to return. And we've seen massive increase in uh, property transactions in places like Prime Central London, where we're starting to see a strong recovery in that very specialised market. Looking to the future, this is Savile's five-year capital growth forecast. And looking at the right-hand column here, the Northwest leads the way with an estimated 28% capital growth over the next five years. And the average across the UK is estimated to be at 21.5%. So looking at these numbers, they're far more sustainable. Um, we mentioned that there'd been you know, an average of 13.2%. That's certainly not sustainable, um, but averaging three, four, five percent a year very much is. And when we look at the uh, rental forecast for the next five years. It's interesting that we see that London um, is the area that will be rebounding the fastest. We do find that in prime central cities, um, especially in London, during the 
COVID pandemic, many people decided that rather than rent in prime central London, which is expensive, why not relocate to the suburbs or even to commuter belt towns where they could save a significant amount of money and they weren't traveling or, or having to travel into the office. That said, as the UK returns to more normality, we are seeing uh, a significant increase of people moving back into the city centres, which is causing a major issue with the availability of rental properties. Now, one of the best indicators of supply demand imbalance is vacancy rates. That is, how many units on the market are unrented and available. So this is a chart from the URA website that was taken in October of this year showing that the vacancy rate in private property is 6.4%, which is quite reasonable. I was reading a, a property guru article last month that is estimating that the vacancy rate could next year go up to somewhere between 8 to 9%. Now, this is important because in Singapore, there's a very high um, owner, uh, home ownership rate it's up at about 90 percent so the other 10 percent of renting are primarily expatriates and depending on the economy it can be that when the economy is down that expatriates lose their jobs and go home and have a major impact on what the vacancy rate is and if you're investing in a property in singapore and uh, people have been relocated and your property is left vacant for several months, then that can be a very large uh, monthly bill that you have to pay if you don't have a tenant paying your rent. Now, this is a, a chart from Life Residential uh, Property Management Company that we work very closely with. They manage over 4,000 properties across Greater London and have eight offices covering the various regions within London. And what we can see is that as we got close to the uh, pandemic, the vacancy rate did increase quite significantly, up to just over 200 properties that were vacant out of 4,000, which represents approximately 5%. But what we are very fast, in fact, the data for October of this year was just 12 units vacant out of 4,000 units, which represents a vacancy rate of just 0.3%. In fact, Life Residential was saying that many of their clients are having to move into temporary accommodation, such as hotels and service departments, because there just isn't enough availability as so many people move back to the city center. Now, the supply and demand deficit is one of the major factors that impacts the price of property and rental growth as well. Here we can see the, uh, the bullet point at the bottom that the government estimates the need for additional housing in England at between 232 to 300,000 new units per year. However, there's been a consistent shortfall of between 40 to 53%. And we can see just from this line graph that even in 1988, the most number of units that are ever delivered in one calendar year was just over 200,000. So it reinforces the fact that the UK has a chronic undersupply of property, which is great for investors because it's going to continue to drive up property prices and rental growth and isn't something that can change overnight. Um, many people say, well, why doesn't the country just build more properties? Well, it's not as simple as that. It can take a lot of time for a developer to find the land buy the land, get the planning permission, then build it um, and then get it uh, either sold or tenanted out. That can easily be a three or four year turnaround. So it's not going to be something that's going to be solved within a few months. And we actually see that the ratio of buyer demand to supply is at a 14 year high. So this supply demand issue is worse now than it has been at any other time in the last 14 years. When we take just the city of London, it's estimated that there's a housing shortage of 52,000 uh, units need to be 
supplied every single year. Well, over the last 10 years, the maximum number of units that was delivered in any one calendar year was 12,500. This figure is just getting worse and worse. 20 years ago, it was estimated about 30,000 units were required. 10 years ago, it was at 43,000, and it's been revised upwards at now 52,000. And the population of London continues to grow. It's estimated there'll be a million more people um, moving to London over the next 10 years. And in both graphs here, for both Singapore and London and the UK, we can actually see that rentals have started to pick up in both uh, countries and cities, uh, indicating that there is a, a movement back to uh, apartments in the city centres and that there is um, a positive light as hopefully we start to move out of this COVID situation. Now this shows the stamp duty brackets in the UK. In this column here, this shows the stamp duty rates for people that reside and live in the UK and will be buying for their own personal use. This would be for people residing in the UK, but investing in a property and renting it out. And this column represents people that reside overseas who would be investing in a property and renting it out. And even though I'm a, a British passport holder, because I reside here in Singapore, then this would be the stamp duty thresholds that I would need to pay based on investing in a property there. And we can see that they do rise quite significantly, above 1.5 million, but up at 17%, which is a big whack. Whereas below 250,000, when we look at what the blended average would be, we're probably looking at somewhere between 5 to 6% on a property below 250,000, which compared with many countries is very reasonable. Here in Singapore, the basic Stamp duty rate is on a sliding scale between 1% to 4% based on these figures here. However, when we look at a second property, an investment property, we take a Singapore citizen as an example, that second property is going to incur an additional 12% over and above the basic rate, which is going to average out at about 15% stamp duty. Now, as we move through the next few slides, I'm going to focus on a Singapore citizen investing in a second property compared with a Singapore citizen investing in an overseas property in the UK. When we look at the cost of acquisition on a 1.5 million uh, Singapore dollar condominium, the breakdown of those acquisition costs is the normal buyer stamp duty at 44,600. The additional buyer stamp duty at 180,000 legal and valuation fees, bringing it to just over 227,000, which represents just over 15% of the purchase price. So, a fairly significant figure when it comes to how much the acquisition costs are relative to the purchase price. Now, this slide shows a, a lot of figures, but let me just focus on a few of the columns. Basically, what we're looking at are different kinds of prop residential property. We've got HDB here, executive condominium, which is a bit of a hybrid, still by HDB, but um, uh, under uh, public housing uh, pricing and uh, labeling. Private property condo, this would be your first one in Singapore. And then if you invest in a second one, a third one and then here on the right is if you're a foreigner whether you're living in Singapore or from overseas buying a property here in Singapore. I'm going to focus on this column here a Singaporean investing in a second property to rent out as an investment but I want to highlight some of the figures here that when it comes to uh, what loan you can get the MAS here in Singapore has strict uh, rules on how much you can lend. So for your first private property, you can get a 75% loan. But that reduces on a second investment property to just 
meaning you need to put a 55% deposit down. On a third, it even goes lower to just 35% loan that you can get. Now that's going to have a huge impact on how much you need to fork out in terms of the cash. Here, this is estimated at a 1.75 million uh, property. The total um, cash outlay would be 1.2 million on a 1.75 million property. Basically, that equates to approximately 70% of the total price of the property. And look here, when it comes to the third property, we can see that this increases to 83%. So it's sucking up a huge amount of the cash that's required. Now what I want to do over the next couple of slides is actually make a comparison between a Singapore entry level condominium at 1 million and a UK entry level condominium estimated at 270,000, which in pounds sterling is between about 140 to 150,000 pounds. So, based on the, the rules and regulations, the stamp duty is roughly 15%, uh, coming to just below 1. Uh, 150,000. With a UK condo at a roughly 5%, that's just 13,500. The loan to value is just 45% in Singapore, whereas we could get up to 70 and maybe even up to 75% in the UK. If you take a loan with a Singapore bank, you will be hit with TDSR, but in the UK, um, if you take a loan with a UK bank, there's no TDSR. So the total cost of acquisition when we compare the stamp duty and the amount that we need to Put down that being 55% on a million dollar property that's 550,000 plus the stamp duty comes to just under 700,000. In the UK, because of a much higher loan to value and a much smaller uh, stamp duty, or and the ticket size of the property, of course, the actual cash required is only 94,000. When it comes to the estimated yields in singapore and i've been quite generous here an estimated yield of residential property at about three percent in reality i would say that's closer to about one to two percent in the uk outside of london we can easily get five six seven percent uh, yields then we estimate what the gross and net income is from those properties which is these figures here the vacancy rate in Singapore is at 6.4%. I took a blended average of cities in the UK at 1.6%. Mortgage, if you remember, um, the mortgage terms in Singapore mean that you can only get a principal and interest, whereas in the UK we can get interest only mortgages. And even with a higher interest rate, because with an interest only mortgage, the monthly servicing would be a lot smaller, even with a, a property that's much cheaper than the one that we're comparing with in Singapore. The income, when we net off the, the mortgage monthly repayment, is $546 as opposed to just $179. Now, some people were asking me when I was emailing out about this webinar when I said that buy seven properties for the price of one in Singapore. Well, you can see here that if we round this figure up to 700,000, and we round this figure up to 100,000, and effectively with the same amount of cash it would cost you to buy one property in Singapore, you could actually buy seven properties in the UK and make a much better positive cash flow from those seven properties. And of course, having diversified into seven properties, you're lowering your risk compared with having all of your eggs in one basket. But let's see what that looks like when we actually put the figures together of buying seven properties uh, compared with one in Singapore. So the purchase price, we mentioned an entry level condo is 1 million in Singapore. When we take that 270,000 and times by seven, it comes to 1.62 million. Stamp duty, just under 150,000, 
in the UK for those seven properties, 81,000. Cash deposit, fairly similar amounts that we're now investing. So this is how much cash we're going to be using for our investments. Monthly positive cash flow, 179 from one property in Singapore, with almost 3,500 from seven properties in the UK. Now, if we take a major assumption here that if properties in both countries double after 10 years, let's see what that um, makes our investment and that return on investment. So the property has doubled in Singapore from 1 million. It's then valued at 2 million in 10 years. In the UK, the seven properties have doubled to 3.78 million. The estimated yield over 10 years in Singapore is just over 21,000. In the UK, it's 458,000. When I take the capital growth, as well as the positive rental income, it's just over 2 million in Singapore, but over 4.2 million in the UK. Now, this is the money that I've put in to the investments. When I return the loans back, then my net uh, profits is just over a million in Singapore and over 2.2 million in the UK. Now, when we look at this as an ROI, the return on investment in Singapore, it's a healthy 150% return on this figure of just under 700,000, but it's a whopping 341,000 from a similar figure on the seven properties. Now, we do need to factor in, excuse me, sorry, the slides are just jumping around a bit there. We do need to factor in capital gains tax. And one of the benefits of living in Singapore is the fact that there is no capital gains tax. So the net amount would still be just over a million with the net ROI at 150%. Now, we've taken a corporate tax rate because if buying the property through a company, it will reduce the uh, corporate and capital gains tax. I've taken a blend, blended average of 15%, which gives us just over 1.9 million net profit, which ultimately translates into a net return of 290% almost double that return in Singapore. So again, it begs the question, if you've been considering about investing in a property, where should you put your hard earned cash? And here we can see that with the same amount of cash, we can have almost double the return on investment. Plus we can spread it across seven properties so that even if one of the properties was vacant for a few weeks or a few months, I've still got the other six properties giving me a good rental income. In Singapore, if my one property is vacant for a few months, I've got no other form of income than an expensive mortgage to be servicing. So here we see a snapshot of some of the properties that we've got in the UK. In the top left, we can see in Manchester, um, we have several properties. The entry level for the Botanic Gardens, which has recently been launched, is £185,000. In the top right, we see some of the Birmingham properties that we have, where one of the entry level properties in Digbeth 1 2, right in the centre of Birmingham, is as little as £160,000. Even in London, uh, we have properties from just under £300,000. And one of the best connected commuter belt towns outside of London called Ashford with properties starting from 180,000 pounds. So here we see um, these properties. Um, the one in Ashford, as I mentioned, starts at 180,000 pounds, has a 999 year lease, estimated to be completed or TOP in 2023 with estimated yields of up to 5.8%. The one in Digbeth, the £160,000 uh, entry level, 250-year leasehold, and is completing literally as we speak. And the recent one that we've launched in Manchester in an area of Old Trafford. So for anybody who's a cricket fan, 
actually it's literally about a four minute walk to the old traffic cricket ground and about an eight nine minute walk to the old Trafford football stadium and very well connected on the tram system so you can get into the center of the city within about eight minutes this is a 250 year leasehold and is estimated to complete in q4 2023 with yield of up to 5.4 percent so this is just a snapshot of some of the properties but you can see that your money is going to go a lot further um, over multiple properties so if you were interested to find out more details the way i like to work with clients is to personalize it by having a zoom call or ideally if you're in singapore meet up on a one-to-one -one basis where i can clearly understand where you are now where you want to get to in the future what are your investment goals what is your uh, risk appetite and many other questions to really zoom in and clarify what it is that you wish to achieve from a property investment so that we can make sure that we can equal or surpass those investment goals so you can see my contact details here please take note of those give me a call or an email and i'd be delighted to assist so thank you very much for your time today um, again i'm richard lowe i work with one global property services and i do look forward to meeting and speaking to you uh, uh, as soon as possible and to as many of you as possible so thank you for attending and uh, i look forward to meeting speaking to you in the future and hoping to see you on many more of my webinars in the future. Thank you.